Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. Well, as you saw from the title of the video, today we're going to take a look at figure painting. And I hope everybody noticed it was figure painting and not finger painting. So let's go ahead and we'll take a look at that. Plus, I'm going to introduce a new feature uh, to my videos, and we'll talk about that when we come back in just a minute. But before we get onto that, I want to remind you, hit that little red uh, subscribe button, and when the little bell comes up, click on it and click all. Thanks now. Now what is this new feature that I'm going to be introducing? Well, in one of the comments in, in last uh, week's video, uh, an individual mentioned that he liked to read all of the comments and that very often he gets as much from the comments as he gets from watching the video. So this suggested to me that, uh, first of all, there's a lot of things that come up in these comments during the discussion afterwards that some people might not be uh, privy to. Uh, there's also uh, things that I forget. And there's also uh, instances where uh, people cannot access the comments. Because if you're watching on a, a television with a Roku connection, uh, you can't access comments. And um, if you're using a mobile phone, well, you might not be able to read those comments all that well. They can be kind of small. So uh, I, I, do, I never read comments on, on my phone. I do read them uh, on, my, uh, I, on my iPad. And of course, you can read them on uh, a desktop or a laptop computer. But I think there's also people out there who are not aware of the comments or just don't feel like uh, it's worth their time to wade through them. But what I will do then is, following each video, I'll go back, take a look at all the comments and things that uh, I forgot to say during the video, and then I'll bring those up at the beginning of the next video. So that will be the feedback section of the video. And I'll try to keep that short. Uh, please uh, take a look at these and see if it's worth your time to take a look at these feedback sections. And if you don't like the feedback, uh, you think I should drop it, let me know. And, you know, after about four, uh, four weeks of this, uh, we'll take a look at uh, how many people want me to keep them, how many people want me to get rid of them, and depending on which way it goes, they'll either stay or we'll get rid of them. Now, I will also point out that as I am starting the feedback section, I will put a timestamp down below me, right in the middle of the screen, right about here, say, uh, so that you can jump to that section and to the beginning of the topic of, of discussion for the main topic for the day. So today it'd be figure painting and you can start at this point here and I'll insert a time right here where you can scroll forward to to jump forward past the feedback discussion section. Now, the first thing I want to uh, relate to you in the feedback is I want to recognize my electronics advisors. And for years now, ever since I started writing my model railroader column, and even before that in many cases, uh, I have collected a number of people that I feel that are highly qualified to give me advice on various matters of electronics because I'm not trained in electronics. I have a PhD in biology and environmental science, uh, but everything I know about electronics, I've learned from reading about it and doing, and, and it's all practical knowledge like that. So when I get into a really technical area, I contact my electrical engineer advisors. And the primary two advisors that I turn to are Larry Meyer. And Larry Meyer is the individual who designs all of the electronics products that I know of, uh, for DCC specialties. And that includes things like the RR amp meter, the PSX series of circuit breakers, and all of the various other electronic devices that he designs for DCC specialties. And he is an electronics engineer and has considerable experience in electronics as well as specifically to DCC electronics. And the other person is a fellow named Mark Gurries, and Mark is an electronics engineer located in California. And he does uh, circuitry design work for various companies in Silicon Valley. And he is very experienced with DCC. He has done numerous uh, clinics for 
uh, the NMRA, given talks at various uh, NMRA meetings around the country, and he's also done a lot of work with NCE products and has written a lot that appears uh, on their website, as well as other websites such as uh, Wiring for DCC, and also he has his own website uh, with very technical descriptions of what happens with various aspects of DCC. So these two guys are people that I trust intimately, and when I get into it, when I have a question that's highly technical, I turn to them. And that was the case with the recent question about what happens at block gaps. So I immediately sent off an email to both of them and asked them what is going on. What was that sizzling that I heard when I left a passenger car sitting across a block gap? And they both, you know, provided me with a, a feedback uh, emails on exactly what was going on. And that was what I related to you in the video as far as the imbalance in the voltages and the potential movement of high amperages through the wires and uh, from one booster to another and the problems it would cause. So that's where that came from. Now on occasions I have gone back to Jim Scorse who owns NCE and AJ Ireland who owns Digitrax and have discussed matters with them as well. But those are very, very technical questions if I have to contact the original designers of this equipment. Now let's go ahead and talk about the uh, main subject for this video, and that is figure painting. Adding figures to your model railroad in the form of uh, little guys on your uh, rolling stock, like this guy here on this uh, transfer caboose, or uh, engineers in your cabs, or people at your stations and, and town scenes, that kind of thing, they can certainly add a lot of interest to a scene and tend to bring it to life and make it look lived in. And so what I want to do today is run through the techniques that I follow when I start painting these little figures. I'm not an artist. I don't claim to be a great figure painter. But I think I can do a reasonable job with these little HO scale guys. So let's go ahead and I'm going to zoom in down here on the workbench and we'll get started with a look at how I do figure painting. Now before we actually get started with doing any painting, I want to talk a little bit about some important tools. Now right off, you're going to need paints. And this is what I use Model Flex for the most part. And it's a really good acrylic paint. I've been using it ever since it originally came out as AccuFlex and then Badger uh, purchased the rights to it and uh, became Modelflex after a while. And it's readily available still from Walther's uh, dealers. Uh, most hobby shops now are only carrying testers products and various other specific uh, gaming uh, paints. But Model Ma uh, Modelflex is still available in all of its railroad colors from uh, Walther's dealers. And I order it regularly from my dealer in uh, South Carolina. The other thing, of course, are various paint brushes. And these are a series of paint brushes that I use. This one here, uh, 5O, 10O, and 20O. The 20 is the smallest of them, and that's the one that I use a lot. If I'm going to be using a uh, something this big, I'll go ahead um, and use that for maybe painting uh, the clothes on people, things that are large areas. But, you know, for most of this stuff, I'm going to be using this 20O paintbrush here. Also, when you get down this small and working with these small little HO scale figures or double O scale figures like these, you're going to need some magnification. And these are just standard drugstore magnifying glasses, reading glasses that you can pick up at drugstores and uh, uh, grocery stores in the U.S. I assume they're available in the U.K. as well. And uh, they're great. They can give you a magnification of uh, various degrees. So you need to try them on uh, and take a look before you buy them. Uh, because some, sometimes if the magnification is too great, it can strain your eyes and be distorted. Now, another thing that I'll also use uh, uh, for really close-up stuff uh, when I'm doing something like a mustache on a guy is these uh, optivizers. And that can help a lot with being able to see what you're doing. Now, as far as picking up these little guys and manipulating them, just a good pair of forceps is, is useful. Um, I have a couple of different ones I use. And then there are these forceps here. 
And these things, they are spring-loaded, so they grip uh, a, a person or whatever you're picking up, and you have to push it apart in order to uh, take the part out. So it's great. You can put the little figure in there and do your painting to the individual, and it will hold it for you. And then you can just set it down and let it dry. Now, another thing that I'll show you here, and I think I got this at, at a place like Michael's or something like that, uh, one of the arts and craft stores, and it's just this little plastic palette with depressions to hold paint. And I use that when I'm going to be mixing paint. So I might just take a couple of drops of, say, dark blue and a couple of drops of white and mix it together to get a lighter color. Or just any kind of, of thing like that, I will take it and mix it in these little depressions here. And then you can just wash it afterwards. And I've had that one for several years. So it's not something you have to uh, buy new ones every week. The other thing here I want to point out are the different qualities of figures. And for that, I'm going to zoom in here and take a closer look at these little guys because they are kind of small. Okay, there we go. So this is a variety of figures. Some are painted, some are unpainted. So right here, um, this little guy here, you can see him. This is one of the uh, little BLI engineers figures that they sell. They're kind of crude, little stick figures, um, probably made in China, painted in China. They're very shiny. And you know, they're not the highest quality by any means. Uh, however, once you put them inside a diesel cab and they're in there, um, you don't see them really. They're there, you can see the individual through the window, but you don't really recognize that they're not all that uh, detailed. And then there are these guys here that have been around quite a number of years. These are HO scale figures. You can get these at Walther's. They come pre-painted and there's also unpainted versions of them. So if you look in the Walther's catalog under the figures, you can find these. And there's just tons of other companies that make HO scale and double O scale and O scale and whatever you need as far as figures go. Now, uh, one thing I want to talk about today, though, is a company in England that is making some wonderful figures. And what I want to do is first show you standard off-the-shelf double O scale figures. This one here is made by Bachmann, so that's an engineer. And of course, this guy here is a, uh, a fireman with his shovel doing his job. And then these little guys here are various double O scale. And I don't know if you can see this. These guys are just unbelievably detailed and they look unbelievably realistic. Also, if you look real close here, they are much truer to scale than, I'm gonna zoom in a bit if I can do that. There, that's about as close as I can get and still stay in focus. But you can see that these little, this little guy here is much more realistic looking. He's much more detailed than the stick figure here that Bachman produces. These guys here though are highly detailed and the way that these are produced is a fellow uh, in England named Alan Butler has a company called Model U. And his website is Model U, and it's M O D E L U dot co dot UK. And these things, what he does is he can go and scan. He has a little portable scanner, looks like an iPad, and he can scan individuals. And then, once they're scanned in, he can make a 3D file, and he can then print these out on a 3D printer. And that's what this is right here. This is a 3D printed locomotive engineer ready to be cut out of the sprue and painted. So basically he can produce these in anything from in scale all the way up to, I believe, 16 millimeter scale. He does this at, at train shows, exhibitions uh, over in, in the UK. And uh, you can also go into his office there. He's located in Bristol on the west coast of England. And um, you can go in there and he will do a scan uh, for you. And he also has a large number of these. He goes around to heritage railways and, and things of that nature and scans individuals in period costume. 
So he has a, a, a full range of these representing time periods from the early 1800s to the present day. And one thing I'll point out, even though these are English men and women from certain eras, uh, if you look back, you will see that there isn't a lot of difference between the way English uh, people look and American people look. And the same thing if you look at various eras, uh, fashions tended to be the same pretty much uh, in the U.S. as they were in England. So you can very easily use these individuals uh, on an American uh, U.S. model railroad, and they look great. And he, can, he has been getting so many HO scale orders lately that he's had to buy another 3D printer just to keep up with the demand for all of the HO scale figures that he has been getting orders for. So these are really a nice. Now this one here I said is an engineer. This one here is a, uh, a fireman. You could also use him for a worker uh, you know, along a road, uh, shoveling coal. Uh, in a coal yard, anything like that. And then here we have, this one here is a, a set, a bundle, and it's the driver and five different passengers for a self-propelled car. Uh, so those came as a, a bundle and he offers a, a, a good price on these bundles. So, you know, take a look at his website and I order these from him and, uh, uh, it's not all that expensive for shipping, maybe uh, 10 or $15, something in that realm, to have it uh, shipped from the UK to the United States. It takes about anywhere from a week to two weeks, uh, depending entirely on how the mail is running at any given time. So what I want to do today, then, is run through the steps that I follow in painting these guys here to arrive at the finished form, like this one right here. And this is one of his very popular fellows, this guy with the beard and uh, hands standing on his hips there. Um, I've used these in all of my UK locomotives for the module. It really helps to populate the cabs because the cabs on those steam locomotives, many of them, was wide open. So you can see them quite readily there. Now, I followed through in a series of steps with these, and the first thing I like to do, as you can see here, is I will paint all of the flesh tones. And for that, as you can see here, I use Model Flex Light Flesh. And I use Light Flesh because there's various tones of flesh available, and you don't need to use the uh, Model Flex. There's various others that are available at your hobby shop. I use the light flesh color because I like to weather these after the fact and it's going to darken the faces. But I'll start with that and do those and any hands, things of that nature. You can see this fellow here. Um, this is another fireman and I've already painted his face and his hands here and right here. So then the next thing after that, uh, I go ahead and start doing other small areas, such as a shirt. Very often these guys wore well, white shirts, so I will do an area of white. And uh, I might also, uh, I usually wait on the shoes and leave those to last because I've got the, uh, uh, the guy pinched here by the shoe in this, uh, in this pair of forceps. But then I'll also do the hat. I think I'll give him a black cap. And uh, for that, I'm just going to dip it in, dip my brush in alcohol, clean it up a little bit. And I very often just work from the cap of the, um, of the bottle. So there's his little cap taken care of. Set him down. I can clean up my brush a little bit. And then let's find some, um, I'm going to get a larger brush and we'll do some large areas such as the uh, um, coat and the pants. So we're going to put some dark blue on him. I have some B&O Royal Blue here in a cap that we can work with.
Okay, so I'm just going to work my way around here and then at high speed and then you can uh, get to see this when it's done. So I'm just going to go ahead and knock off the rest of the coat here. And this guy appears to have a pair of overalls on that go all the way up to here. Okay, I think that's got his coat. Now, I'm going to do his overalls, which is going to require a little paint because what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume he's wearing some weathered denim type or weathered uh, some pants that uh, have faded a bit. So they're going to be a slightly lighter color than the top. Okay, so what I've done is I've taken some of that uh, dark blue paint here and some light gray. This is a uh, um, Southern Pacific letter gray. And I'm just going to take and dab some of that in here until we get a lighter color. Very light. Okay. And because that's very light blue, I'm going to take and add a little bit of weathered black to it. And we'll use that to darken it a bit. There we go. I like that color there. So now we have a lighter blue that we can use for his faded pants. And, you know, this could be dungarees, denim pants that have been uh, weathered and faded. Uh, in England, they. Uh, I uh, used, I think, more of a twill type uh, material uh, commonly, but it tended, to, um, it tended to weather fast from the darker blue that they uh, started out. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and let's see how this looks on the legs. Oops, way too much paint on that brush. One of the stories that I heard about the, uh, the UK crews is that they would take their dirty clothes, their coats and pants, and um, when they were working in the cab of the locomotive, they would just take hot water out of the boiler and put it in a bucket with their clothes in it. And so they would get a steaming hot water bath, basically, for their pants and their jackets and over time that tended to quickly fade that tended to quickly fade the colors quite a bit okay so you can get an idea of how he's going here Okay, I'm going to let him sit a minute and clean my brush and we'll do a little something else. Well, it's taking a lot longer to do this video uh, than I had initially anticipated. In addition, as I'm sure you noticed, I had considerable problems keeping the uh, figures in the scene because I was zoomed in as close as I could get and unfortunately I'd start off with the little guy uh, that I was working on right in the middle of the scene very often and it would slowly move off camera and so I ended up having to cut out a lot of the video and I also speeded up portions of it just to get through the painting procedure uh, without boring you to death. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to break it into two parts and the first 
uh, part of the video, part one, is what you're watching now uh, that I've posted on Friday. And then on Monday, I will come out with a second video that will be part two, where we'll go ahead and uh, finish work on this little guy here and get him weathered and uh, dry brushed and ready to go uh, in the cab of a locomotive. I'll also have another uh, feedback segment for you, and we'll cover that at the beginning of the video on Monday. So have a great weekend, and we'll see you here on Monday with part two of the video on figure painting. Bye now.